The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a massive late winter storm heads to the Midwest with a destructive weather system called a bomb cyclone. And Maduro henchmen roam the dangerous border of Venezuela where CBN's Chuck Holton is attacked. Then, before you file your taxes, find out what you really owe and see why getting a smaller refund might actually be a good thing. Plus, the jockey whose horse won the Kentucky Derby. He knew he did something special. And then claimed the next two legs of the Triple Crown. Just incredible. Meet horse racing legend Mike Smith. You're trusting him with your life. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks. You find this bit of news interesting? I was reading today that we have more millionaires in the United States than there are people who live in Sweden. Wow. How about that? That's that a good way to start your day. <laughs> the other thing, uh, uh, well, this bomb cyclone is crazy. So what in the world is going on with the weather? But uh, hurricane force winds and a blizzard? Are, are mauling the Midwest. The storm is called a bomb cyclone. Colorado Springs felt a wind gust of 97 miles an hour. And, uh, well, we, we're going to take a look at that and some other things on the highway of trains thrown off the track. It's crazy, yeah, Terry. Trailers overturned. Well, the storm shut down the Denver airport, leaving thousands of people stranded. It's also caused at least one death. Washington reporter Jenna Browder reports. What was supposed to be an ordinary winter storm has turned into a bomb cyclone when atmospheric pressure drops low enough to bring hurricane winds, tornadoes, and severe blizzards. In Colorado, whiteout conditions. Colorado Springs saw one wind gust of 97 miles an hour, the same as a Category 2 hurricane. I grew up in New Orleans, so I've seen a hurricane, but this is a snow hurricane. The storm forced Denver International Airport to close all runways, canceling more than 1,300 flights. And on the roads, parts of Interstates 25 and 70 were shut down by crashes, stranding some 1,000 drivers. The storm turned deadly when this Colorado State Trooper responded to a crash and was hit by a sliding car. Roughly half a million people lost power in Colorado and Texas, winds flipping these small airplanes like toy models. In New Mexico, a funnel cloud caught on video. Near Logan, heavy winds knocked these train cars right off the tracks. Even weather experts are surprised at the storm's ferocity. This meteorologist trying to release a weather balloon in South Dakota. This time of the year produces these monsters, folks, from time to time. Now, the positive spin on this, if you want to put it that way, is there was so much energy focused with the storm. If you look at the usual tornado outbreaks that occur with these big storms that go up into the plains, very minimal overall. Then the storm is rolling right along, expected to cross the Great Lakes today and tomorrow, bringing rain to the northeast and possible tornadoes to the south. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, uh, something else is happening. Uh, the uh, 737 MAX has been grounded here in the United States. Boeing has sold 5,000 of those things. It is a huge moneymaker. It has been the most popular plane probably they've ever produced. And this is hitting them really hard. John Jessup has more. That's right, Pat. After mounting pressure, the Federal Aviation Administration grounded those Boeing planes Wednesday. The decision follows the global response already taken by dozens of countries, banning the plane after the Ethiopian Airlines crash Sunday. All 157 people on board were killed. Another MAX 8 plane, an Indonesian Lion Air, crashed four months earlier, killing 189. 
The FAA said the decision was made after enhanced satellite tracking data and new physical evidence on the ground actually linking the movements of the two planes that led to those crashes. Well, the lights are starting to come back on in parts of Caracas, Venezuela's capital, but the extended power outage sent a tidal wave of people fleeing the country. In the border town of Cucuta, Colombia, thugs paid by Nicolas Maduro's regime are targeting people for robbery and kidnapping. That's where CBN contributing correspondent Chuck Holton had a dangerous encounter. So the border between Venezuela and Colombia is now officially closed. The bridge that two weeks ago when I was here had tens of thousands of people crossing it now is essentially empty. But this is what they call La Trocha. This is how people are getting across now. And as you can see, it has not affected the number of people crossing. They're just now crossing in a very different way. They call this the shortcut. But for those fleeing Venezuela, crossing illegally is fraught with risk. These people say they're being preyed upon by members of criminal biker gangs called colectivos, who support Nicolas Maduro and charge a fee or even rob people trying to get across the river. And they aren't making empty threats. As I was filming on the riverbank, I was attacked by three men who tried to drag me into Venezuela. Now it's empty, but people are not... <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, man, come on, man. Fortunately, I was able to get away from my attackers and they fled back across the river. But it was a powerful lesson in how Maduro's brutal regime uses its power against these people every day. From Cucuta, Colombia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Thanks, Chuck. The Republican-controlled Senate is expected to pass a resolution blocking President Trump's declaration of a national emergency on the southern border today. The House already approved the resolution last month. The president is expected to veto the measure so he can access $8 billion to build a border wall. If the vote goes as expected, it would be the president's second defeat this week as the Senate voted Wednesday to end U.S. military involvement in Yemen. Well, Texas Democrat Beto O'Rourke says he's running for president in 2020. The 46-year-old three-term congressman made the announcement in a video recorded from his home with his wife at his side. Beto gained national attention in the 2018 midterm elections when he came within three percentage points of upsetting Republican Senator Ted Cruz, raising records amount of cash while mobilizing young people and minorities. Pat? Thank you. You know, there's an interesting thing going on. The Democrats have a woman who filled out an application. She's, she's a, a native-born American uh, of uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, descent. And when she filled out an application some years ago, she said she is American Indian. And so you think, all right, we've got a senator who claims to be American Indian. Now we've got an Irishman who has picked up a Mexican name that Beto is a, uh, a lesion of the uh, Spanish word Roberto. And uh, he is claiming essentially, he's running essentially as a half Mexican, Beto O'Rourke. He's actually uh, a long time, he's Irish and Welsh by all his background. But in order to go after Ted Cruz, he decided he was going to be half Mexican, Beto. So he's kept that name, even though it stands for uh, Roberto, uh, which came from being born in, uh, you know, one of the border cities in Texas. Um, and then you've got Kamala Harris. I'm not sure what her background is, but uh, I'm sure it's not whatever they're being claimed. And then before long, we, we had another president who uh, was the son of an uh, African well, he was a radical, he was a communist. Uh, uh, his name was Obama, and that was a mixed uh, situation. That, uh, but the thing about Obama was he thought that he had a Messiah complex, and he said, I have a gift. He said that, I have a gift, and uh, my uh, speaking is so gifted. Well, I'm afraid this uh, Beto... Uh, has said pretty much the same thing in Vanity Fair. I, 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 like I've seen a vision, I'm kind of like the Messiah, and uh, I have a call uh, from on high to run. So 
I don't know how many of these uh, Democrat messiahs we need in our country, but I just as soon not have any of them. Uh, John? Pat, across America, young people are being turned away from, some Christ, uh, from Christianity as some schools and universities question the validity of the Bible. But as Chris Mitchell reports, a new movie is out presenting strong evidence for the Bible's authority and one of its best known authors. The new film, Patterns of Evidence, The Moses Controversy, looks at a debate entering today's college classrooms. The Moses Controversy is really the question of, did Moses write the first books of the Bible? And for a lot of Christians, it's not a controversy at all. But as soon as you send your son or daughter off to college or university, they're going to hear a different story. Film producer Timothy Mahoney says this lack of understanding is rampant in today's higher learning. It's huge, the number of people uh, in mainstream scholarship that don't believe that Moses was the author of the first books of the Bible. And so they're basically saying, well, this is just a beautiful piece of literature, but it's not real history. And Mahoney says that's the issue. The problem with that is that Jesus believes that Moses wrote the first books of the Bible. In fact, it, uh, Jesus says, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Mahoney traveled thousands of miles and spent years investigating the Moses question. What I realized is that if Moses doesn't exist and Moses didn't write these first books of the Bible, this impacts the rest of the Bible. While many mainstream scholars cast doubt on the history and archaeology of Moses, Mahoney says he can show why they're wrong. In fact, this film is going to show you Bible-affirming evidence that Moses had the ability to write the first books of the Bible. With biblical values under assault in today's culture, Mahoney says his project can speak to both believer and skeptic. Now, if you have a family member that doesn't believe, and you want to, you've been looking for an opportunity to bring them to something such as, uh, or to, to talk to them about the Bible, this film is a perfect tool for that because it's, it's done very scientifically. Mahoney says today's generations have doubts and ask tough questions. But there are answers for these questions. Uh, we don't have to lose our sons and daughters, you know, to skepticism. Mahoney says in order to know God, people need to know his word. And he hopes his film will tie that understanding together. It shows that this ability to do exactly what was commanded in the Bible fits the history and the archaeology, matches the Bible. The pattern of evidence fits. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Patterns of Evidence, the Moses Controversy, will be in theaters across the country on March 14th, 16th, and 19th. You can go to CBNNews.com to find a theater near you. Pat, back to you. Well, there's no question that the Israelites came out of Egypt. There's no question that this group of people was being persecuted by Pharaoh, and uh, they, they had what was called the Exodus. And the leader of that Exodus was a man named Moses who had been drawn from the waters. Uh, uh, that's where the term came from. Uh, the, he was put in a basket by Pharaoh's daughter, and he was raised in the household of Pharaoh. And uh, he, the Bible says he was uh, uh, trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So he was a, a scholar, as, but he was also a warrior. And uh, he grew up in Pharaoh's house. There's no doubt about that. And so then he went out and, and came back into, into Egypt later on after many years in the wilderness. And he led the people then up into the promised land. There's nothing that would be contrary to the fact that he could have been the author of these books. Well, why not? I mean, you know, one is a book of laws. Another has to do with uh, the history of the, of the people. And uh, you have a genealogical record of the births of the people. You know, you read all that. And, uh, but Genesis was, goes back to the beginning, and then Exodus talks about uh, coming out of Egypt. Well, well, why not Moses? I mean, who else could have done it? And it, it didn't uh, detract in any way the fact that he was a living person. Everybody knows Moses, and uh, there are a whole group of Jewish people who certainly believe in the books of the Bible. Then you've got the Ten Commandments that have been preserved through the years. Uh, the uh, Hebrew text of the Old Testament is 
amazingly preserved. Every letter uh, all the way through is uh, scrutinized uh, by uh, scholars. And that record is uh, goes way, way back. And uh, it's a good, authentic record. So I appreciate what these people are doing. But, you know, scholars will do everything they can to distort the truth. That's what's so terrible. Yeah. Well, and the whole education system has been infiltrated with that kind of doubt and really lack of understanding of all of this. So our kids are really... Well, you know, the, 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 the route, I keep talking about Teachers College at Columbia, but the Teachers College at Columbia was the uh, uh, source, and the, the man in charge of it was an atheist, a, a hardcore atheist, and uh, th they trained teachers over and over and over again and have infected the educational system of America. So you have some of the most virulent uh, anti-Christians located in the educational establishment. And uh, I'm pleased to report that Regent University right now is training a new generation of teachers, and they are taking positions of educational leadership all across the country. There's some dedicated, wonderful teachers. and uh, But nevertheless, this uh, teacher's college in Columbia, I think it's, it's lost its impact of what it used to be, but nevertheless, it had a profound impact on the educational system. Well, it sounds like this film is going to be something worthy of oh, our time. Absolutely. And, and so significant. I didn't get when it's going to be available. Well, go to CBN.com because all of it is there. You can find out where it's going to be seen in your area. There is a limited viewing, but um, be sure to take advantage of that and support the film as well. All right. Well, coming up, did you receive a smaller tax refund this year compared to last year? Well, if so, the reason is not what you may think. Tax, tax expert Dan Pilla explains why a smaller refund is actually a good thing after this. <laughs> Well, it's tax time, as you know, and uh, many Americans are, well, it'll be tax time on April the 15th, but uh, many Americans are receiving smaller federal tax refunds compared to last year. And that's led to some taxpayers complaining that they've been uh, overcharged. Well, is that uh, true or not? Let's take a look. Democrats are up in arms over a Treasury Department report showing tax refunds this year are down about 9% over last year, and they're blaming President Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. California Senator Kamala Harris tweeted, the average tax refund is down about $170 compared to last year. Let's call the president's tax cut what it is, a middle-class tax hike to line the pockets of already wealthy corporations and the 1%. But tax expert Dan Pilla says Democrat lawmakers and some taxpayers are looking at it all wrong. He says receiving a smaller refund is actually a good thing because that refund is only what you overpaid in taxes and is no indication of whether your tax liability went up or down. Pilla also says that the whole controversy shows that the average person has no idea what they pay in taxes, and he says that's the problem with the system. Many taxes are hidden, and people don't know what their tax burden actually is. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. And tax expert Dan Pillis is joining us here. It's always a pleasure to have him. Dan, good to see you it's again. It's good to see you, Pat. Hey. Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you very much, sir. I'm getting close. You're getting, getting close. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, what is the deal on this tax refund? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, first of all, it's never a good thing to get a tax refund because it means you overpaid. Yeah. All right? The typical taxpayer overpays by about $3,000 a year. That means you're paying about $275 a month, month in and month out, in taxes you don't owe. Right. And, and, you, and you have to wait a full year, actually more than a year, 14, 15 months before you get your money back. And then they don't give you any interest. 
So it's the world's worst way to save money. Why do people do that? Well, they do that primarily out of ignorance. They don't know how to fill out the, uh, the withholding form, the W-4 form, yeah. to report to their employer the correct number of allowances that, they're, that they want to claim. And so they think they have to overpay their taxes because they think this withholding is just automatic. And it's not. You have the right to adjust the withholding to match your tax liability. And people just don't know how to do that. The National Taxpayer Advocate has reported to Congress that the vast majority of American people have no idea how to work their way through that W-4 instruction form because it's so confusing. And this is part of the problem with the tax law. And they do it on purpose, Pat, because yeah. they want the money. They want the money. <laughs> what about the whole you fill out a postcard and send it uh, in? That, and that's a farce, too. Listen, <laughs> the, 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 tax, the tax form was redesigned. All they did is they took 79 questions yeah. or 79 lines off of the Form 1040, and they spread those 79 lines over six additional attachments, attachments to the tax return. So the Form 1040 is shorter now. It's only 12 or 14 lines. Yeah. But all the rest of those 70, what, what uh, 65 lines or so are spread over six more forms. Incredible. So it's a, it's a complete farce. It's a total <laughs> farce. What about this deal about those uh, uh, states like California and New York that... Uh, uh, have um, such high taxes and they don't get a deduction on their state taxes beyond a certain percentage. Well, what happened is they capped the deduction for state and local taxes at $10,000. Yeah. All right. And so these states that have high taxes, New York, California, uh, uh, you know, a couple of the other states out there, Connecticut and so forth, New Jersey, they're all complaining that now their citizens have to pay higher federal taxes mm -hmm. because they can't get a full deduction for their state income taxes. My advice to the high tax states, cut your tax burdens, lower your taxes for your citizens. Don't don't whine about the cap on the deduction. Lower your tax burdens for the, for the citizens of your states. That's why people are leaving those high tax states. Well, they Pat. really are, aren't they? They are. They're, they're leaving those high tax states. What are the low, low, low tax? Uh, do you have any clients that you recommend that they go to Florida? Or, or <laughs> I've got a lot of clients that, have, of course, I have I have clients all around the country, yeah. and so you know we, we got them everywhere. But but yeah, the fact of the matter is that there's all kinds of people that are leaving the high tax jurisdictions that are going going to lower tax states. But here's the thing about the setup piece that I want to talk about. You know. They talked about uh, they talked about early on the tax refunds being down. But yeah. Pat, when they did that, when they did that analysis, that was over a month ago when they did that. There was fewer than 20 million tax returns that were filed. Mm -hmm. All right, and so it was a very small sample size. Now they redid the analysis just the other day. I got most recent numbers with me right now, based on over 50 million tax returns that were filed. So almost a third of the returns are in now. The tax refunds are up. The average tax refund is higher now. Yeah. than it was last year. So these these people that are that are claiming that the lower tax refunds prove that it's tax that, that the Jobs Act was tax cuts for the rich, it's complete nonsense. It's a total fraud. The fact of the matter is 80% of the people out there are going to see a tax cut. And now we're seeing that manifest in higher refunds, not lower refunds, higher refunds than last year as more of the tax returns roll in uh, well, during the tax in terms season. Of the actual tax burden, the, the Democrats say, well, only it help the top 1%, it's a tax cut for the rich, et cetera. Talk about that. Well, it's just a complete farce, it is. Pat. It's just absolute. Listen, the Democrats, the leftist Democrats, continue to pound on this idea that every tax uh, reform is nothing but tax cuts for the rich. And it's simply nonsense. The fact of the matter is the top 1% of income earners pay about 13% of all of the taxes paid. The top 5% the top of income earners pay over 60% over of the tax burden. There is no, there is no such thing as rich people not paying taxes. It's just complete nonsense. Well, you hear Bernie Sanders saying, well, let's make the tax code uh, fairer and, and, and let's make the rich pay their, quote, fair share. What is that? Well, well there's, no, there's no definition of fair share, Pat. That's the problem. There's no definition of it. And, and, and now Bernie Sanders is proposing a wealth tax, yeah. right? Not an income tax, not a tax based on what you earn. He wants a second assessment on top of the income tax based on the assets that you've accumulated. It's like an estate tax, Pat, only you're not dead yet. These people don't even want to wait until you're dead before they steal your money. Well, that's unconstitutional. Isn't it? well, it's, it's, it's immoral and it's unconstitutional. <laughs> yeah. and it, it's, it's just out. It, 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 listen, there's no other way to describe that kind of tax. It's outright, unadulterated, unmitigated theft. That's what it is. Well, what do you think the Democrats have gone so far to the left on their proposals? It's just insane. I mean, 
Medicare for all, uh, tuition for all. Is They're there. falling all over themselves to create to create more giveaway programs to to entice people to vote for something for nothing. That's what it's all about. It's all about how can we give how can we gi how can we buy votes for the leftist Democrats as fast as we possibly can. Now, here's the thing that's troubling about yeah. Bernie Sanders and his, and his wealth tax. All right. according, according to a political poll, 60% right. of the people that were polled, Pat, are in favor of this thing as long as it's pointed at quote-unquote rich people. Here's what the problem is. Mm. The leftist Democrats think that anybody who's making $100,000 a year or more is rich. That's what the definition is. Listen, Pat, that's, you know, when you got a husband and wife, you got two or three kids in the family, 100,000 a year is not that much money. It's not. Yeah. It's not that much money. What is the average income these days? The, the, the median income right now is about $54,000, plus or minus. Well, that's not really enough to live very well on. No, it's not, especially if you consider that you got a family. If you got, if you got a one income earner, and we're talking about $55,000 a year, yeah. roughly, a kid or two, you know, two or three kids, that's not a lot of money. If you've got a husband and wife that are out there in the, in the workforce, you know, now we multiply that times two, basically. So you've got, you know, there's your $110,000 a year. You're a rich family. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's rich by, the, by their definition. And they just want to steal more of your money because they think that somehow you're taking advantage of the system because you're out there working hard and trying to make a living. You know, you remember Obama? You didn't build that. You know, yeah, you, you didn't, didn't make that. No, we did that. The government did that for you. The government did. Yeah, <laughs> the government did that for you. You didn't did, do that did by you yourself. Did you see that statistic I mentioned earlier that we have more millionaires in America than there are people living in Sweden? Is yeah, easy. Have yeah, you I, checked that? Is, I, is I, that did, a true I did statement? see that. Yep. Yep. And that's astonishing. And you know what? God bless these people. Yeah. Listen, here's the thing, Pat. If you make the money honestly, yeah. if you don't steal it from somebody, if you earn earn the money peacefully then you have a right to use and enjoy that money. Mm -hmm. You don't owe it to the government, and you certainly don't owe it necessarily to somebody who didn't earn it. Now, you've got a, a biblical responsibility and a moral responsibility to voluntarily give back, tithe to churches and organizations that are going to use that money to help people that are downtrodden and so forth. You know, we all understand those biblical principles, but those principles are based on conscience, and those principles are based on voluntary action, not the force of government. Yeah. When you've got the government that's got a gun to your head, that's not charity, Pat. That's theft. How come the, the majority of people, these young people, would take to think socialism is a good thing? Socialism is horrible. Well, because they're ignorant. They're ignorant. Listen, it's as simple as this. Our, our, our schools are turning out high school kids that, that, are, that are ignorant of, of civics. I'll give you some numbers from, right, the, from, the, uh, from the National Report Card. Of course, you know this is the organization that, that uh, looks at what the educational levels are right. in, in our high schools. And we've got numbers that show that, uh, that fewer than 40% of the high school graduates, now we're talking about high school seniors, are proficient in reading. Fewer than 35% are proficient in writing. Fewer than 25% are proficient in civics, and this is the number that I, that I remember vividly, is 12% are proficient in U.S. history. So we've got generations of kids, Pat, that can't read and write, that don't know how their government works, and, that, and, and know nothing about U.S. history. And so when you take all of that and you add all that together, what you get are socialists, because these are the people who think that somehow government is going to do them a favor, that somehow government can give them something for nothing. It's ignorant talking, Pat. That's all it is. Well, that's a shocking indictment on our educational yeah, system, it's, though, isn't it's, it? It's, just, it, it's what we call the failed academy, for sure. Well, you know, they, they've had that, that modern math and that modern uh, teaching and so forth that, that just is uh, absurd. The people aren't being taught to be. They can't read and write. They're functionally illiterate by the time they get through the third grade. Yeah. And, and but you're saying it's a generation of socialists of ignorant socialists is being that, that's what it is. I mean, listen, the, the 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 more ignorant people are of history, yeah, the more they tend to believe that socialism is a good thing. The more educated people are when it comes to history, the more they realize that socialism is not only a failed system, Pat, it's a diabolical system that is responsible for the murder of hundreds of millions of people across across the world. It is, it is not, oh, and listen, we don't have any better example in front of our face yeah, right now not. than what's going on in Venezuela. Absolutely. And, and yet and yet people look at that, I don't even think they look at it, Pat. The mm -hmm. thing is they don't even look at it. And yet there it is, right there, a glaring example of what's going on. I would like to launch the 
Dan Pillar for President of the Society of Universities. <laughs> <laughs> Very articulate. Thank you, Dan. God Thank bless you. God you. God Appreciate bless you. it. All right. Terry, what's next? Well, we want you to know Dan has many resources. You can find out more about what he has, including his book, How to Win Your IRS Tax Audit. It's all on our website. Go to cbnnews.com for those links. Now, coming up, the oldest jockey to win horse racing's most coveted triple crown. To win one of the triple crown races is amazing, but to pull them all off, uh, it truly is life changing. It'll, it'll forever, no matter what, what happens at this moment on, you know, we'll go down in history. Mike Smith talks about his glory days on Justify when we come back. American jockey Mike Smith has 26 Breeders' Cup wins, the most of any jockey. He's also the second leading jockey of all time in earnings. And last year, Smith rode Justify to the Triple Crown, setting a record as the oldest jockey to win that title at age 52. Well, recently, sports reporter Tom Beering talked with Smith about the legacy of faith behind his incredible success. On a dirt stretch sprint aboard a horse named Justify, Mike Smith was forever decorated with racing grandeur. I mean, when you're best enough to just to win one of the Triple Crown races is amazing, but to pull them all off, uh, it truly is life changing. It'll, it'll forever, no matter what, what happens at this moment on, you know, we'll go down in history. June 9th, 2018 from the Belmont Stakes. With over 5,400 career wins, the accomplished competitor becomes the 13th and oldest jockey to win the Triple Crown. Mike, what do you think is the benefit of you waiting so long to become the Triple Crown winner? Uh, God has a way of giving you things uh, that, that you're able to, to, to handle. I'm not too sure at a young age if I'd have handled it all so well. The success of it? The success uh, to really appreciate what what happened and what we were we were blessed to accomplish uh, is it was the most humblest, complete feeling you've ever felt in your life. I don't know if I'd have felt that in my 20s. You know, here in my 50s now, at, at this stage of my career, towards the back end of it, just incredible. When and where was that, where you thought, this is my race to take? Really the most important part was the break. I thought that if we could jump very well, if you could get out of there really good, BNZ was in the one hole, pretty much would have this race won. You know, I just kept smiling. At the 3 8 pole, thinking to myself, let's go do this. Let's go have fun. And just him just taking off. Immediately, the history sets in. Does the horse sense the moment? They certainly know when they won, and they certainly know when, they, when they've lost. They'll hang their heads and walk back when they've gotten beat. Justify, it was an extremely beautiful, proud horse, and, and he kind of knew it. <laughs> I remember uh, Bob saying when they got back to the barn, he was already just full of himself, man. Just, he, knew he, did, he knew he did something special. Your respect for, demand of, companionship with the horse. It's about getting along with him. Their mouth is very, very important. Uh, it's the sense of everything. I treat the horse's mouth the way I'd want someone to treat mine, or so say my mother's. Extremely delicate, kind. Every now and then you might have to be a little bit firm, but, but all in all, it's, it's, it's just finesse. I get along with a horse probably better than I do people, to be honest with you. How do they earn your trust? Some of them ain't so trustworthy. <laughs> but you'd be surprised on a whole, uh, most of them are. You have to trust them. You know, you really, you truly do. You, you're trusting him with your life. You're on him, and my job is to get the one that's way back there to believe that he can actually be the one that's in front. And I only have five minutes before I get in the gate to figure it all out. Talk to me about that tandem. It's, it's a give and take. It's, it's a very slight touch, sometimes an extremely hard touch, just depending on what the situation is. But they're trained so well uh, before they even get into a race. Uh, they actually know their job pretty good. You'd be surprised how intelligent they are. My first interaction with a horse is just being very calm, hang my feet a little bit, maybe give them a little hug with my legs. I don't know, they take a deep breath and they kind of let it out and I know that I have them at that moment. I feel that we've connected. It can happen in a matter of just a few steps. What is it about a horse that all of us could learn something from? Hmm, that's a great question. There's so many things. You never conquer it. You just learn to get better at it. You learn to work with it. And, you know, not just about a horse and, and 
so many different things in life, but to be around a horse just makes it even that much more special. What compels you, your Triple Crown champ, to willingly wear a bridle of humility? I'm just being me. <laughs> you know, my grandparents were a big uh, influence in my life growing up. They were just wonderful people. My grandmother believed in the Lord, like, so strong, it was amazing. And I can remember as a young child, just always talking about it, praying about it. I think that's where it comes from. So you got me emotional, see. <laughs> what do you admire most about the Savior we follow? Everything I do in life is, is about Him. Uh, there's not a second in the day that, that, that I'm not talking to Him, all, all the time. Fitting that that comes from a jockey, right? Who's in tandem with a horse? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's, I'm just doing what I, what I love. And having a, a wonderful time at it, it also gives me a, a chance to show people where it comes from. She's my Lord and Savior, you know? I mean, I'm a strong believer. I don't try to push it on people. It just, it's just there. In the Bible, it talks about when Jesus comes back, and of all things, riding, on a white horse, as a jockey, what is it about a horse do you think that he would choose to come riding on? Oh, wow, just how magical they are. They're just beautiful. What else would you ride in on? It has to be a horse. They just look at them. I mean, they're the most beautiful creatures you've ever seen. I mean, the muscle tone and, and, and their power, their beauty, their strength, how fast they are, it's incredible. I've heard owners comment, Mike was justified after all these years to win. Before I even saw him, there's this horse that's name is Justified, right, right away it was, that's a powerful word. The chosen one, so to say. To me, when you say that word, it reminds me of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's just what it is. And I felt that way when I rode him, when I was on him. You just knew you were on something special. What a fascinating story, and what a fascinating relationship this man has had with that you know, horse. Uh, winning the Triple Crown is, is every bit as important as winning the Super Bowl. Oh I mean, goodness. this is a huge, huge thing. Only a few horses have ever done it because, they, they, uh, first, they're young. Mm -hmm. The Kentucky Derby is very exhausting. Then they've got to go shortly thereafter, run the Preakness. Uh, in uh, Maryland, and then they've got to go up and, and do that long, long uh, Belmont, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, like a mile and a half, and it's uh, exhausting. And to find a horse that can do all three of them, and a jockey that can ride them. And interesting enough, the the owner of that uh, the, that horse is a born again Christian. He's a wow. software wow. Uh, magnet. He's made a lot of money in in high tech, and uh, he just got this marvelous horse and. But there are not many of them have ever done that. It's an amazing thing. And Mike Smith's an extraordinary, the fact that, I mean, it's dangerous. You're a little old guy sitting on top of something that weighs about 1,200 pounds, going as fast as he can. And uh, here you are perched up in that thing. The slightest movement of that horse can throw a jockey off. I mean, it's just. Well, the slightest movement of the jockey can, can, can throw the horse, throw the horse, off. The horse yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you are very familiar with that relationship between a rider and a horse. I mean, your whole life you've been able to uh, do that. I was riding a high level dressage, and the horse gets so that they know exactly what you want to do. If you can think pictures, if you can see a picture, the horse can. You can communicate with an animal. They are very, very sensitive uh, to your moods and what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. And so if you're frightened, they get frightened. If, if you're confident, they're confident. And if you see, and they'll want to do everything to please you. They, uh, the, they're wonderful animals. And the fact they're so mistreated so often and, and spurred and kicked mm -hmm. and pulled and all that. Uh, I used to have, was taught that, you see my hand here. That, that's all the pressure you need on a rein. You never jerk a horse. You just, all you have to do exactly. is just, just, just squeeze your, squeeze your hand. Mm -hmm. And the horse feels it. And you know, yeah. they're very sensitive. Well, they certainly are majestic. Yeah, they are. <laughs> well, the one thing that when they, when they get acquainted with each other, they blow on each other's noses. So when I'd get with a horse, I'd blow on his nose <laughs> and let him know that I speak horse. I speak equine. <laughs> and then, you know, He's never spoken it here, but he, I do know that he knows how to do it. I know. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, what you got? Okay, well, it's time for some email. Pat, this first one comes from Marie, who says, Pat, my husband says he's a Christian, but he lives a sinful life. He has a gambling addiction, which has put us in debt and behind on bills, and this affects my credit, too. I try to encourage him, and I pray for him. He begs God to take this addiction away, but still wants to live a sinful life. What else should I do? Um, you know, the Bible says that those are in the flesh cannot please God. And this man is in the flesh. The, the flesh, the carnal nature has got control of him. And that man has never been born again. His spirit is not in control <laughs> of his life. Uh, he, you know, and we say, well, he's a nice man and all that. Oh, he's a wonderful provider. But he's not born again. And those that are living by the carnal nature cannot please God. So what do you do with a situation like that? You don't reform somebody like that. He's got to be transformed. And I, I, I don't know. One thing about though the fact that he's building up debts and signing stuff, you better be careful just from a practical standpoint that you're not getting sucked into it. Because if you've signed documents, especially a tax return that is in, inaccurate, uh, the feds will come after you. You say, well, I didn't know what I was doing. Yes, you, that's tough luck. You've got to be careful with that. And what do you do? I don't like to counsel a breakup of marriages, but a thing like that, this man is going to destroy you unless he gets born again. All right? This is Todd who says, what about Christians who never get their healing? I don't mean an end of life illness, but a lifelong illness or condition that the Lord never delivers them from. Are they not praying correctly or living correctly? Is that why they never receive a healing? Um, I, I don't have the answer to that. Of course, you've asked me too much. Well, why aren't people healed? Uh, there's some people really who are content with their sicknesses. They, 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 the sickness becomes a a crutch they can lean on and the fact that, well, I can't compete here because I've got a bad hip or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the case. I, I don't know. But there's some people that have resentment. If, if somebody has resentment in their heart against somebody, they're not going to get healed. If somebody has a long-standing uh, animosity uh, against somebody, there's so many things. They need to get their hearts right with God. Uh, and I, I don't know what else to say. You ask me, how come they're not healed? Well, there are many, many things why they're not healed, but there are a couple of them. All right. Okay, Kitty and Paul are asking, Pat, help us understand how you can lump Social Security in with entitlements. We and our employers paid into it for 45 plus years to ensure we had age, old age benefits. Uh, do you know what the word entitlement means? It means you're you're entitled to something. <laughs> that, that means you're owed it. That's what entitlement is. And that's what the term means. How can I lump it together? Well, you've paid in for sure, but the Congress took your money and lumped it together with the current account, and they spent the money. It doesn't exist in that form. They may have put some government bonds in there. How can I lump it together? You've paid in. I've paid in. I'm still paying. I'm still paying on all that Medicare stuff. And they keep hitting me, and they, they refuse to give me Medicare because I have private health insurance, so they won't pay Medicare. So I'm paying in just because I'm paying. And I've, they've capped off the amount of Social Security, but sure, you pay in. Uh, how can I lump it together? Well, entitlement means you're entitled to something. So it's not a bad term. <laughs> you know. But those big accounts are so huge, they're going to sink the federal government because the debt is already enormous. And you add to that another, oh, it'll be maybe 50, 60 trillion dollars against what we've already got. And it's going to destroy the federal fiscal system. It's got to be taken care of. And if they don't do it, we're in trouble. All right. Okay, here's a viewer who wants to know, in the gospel account of Jesus casting out the demons from the man into the herd of pigs, why did Jesus allow the demons to request their own destination? And furthermore, why did he grant their request? Well, how am I going to tell you what was in Jesus' mind? Why did Jesus do what he did? He's son of God. He's a perfect man. But he granted the uh, desire of, of those demons. He said, let us come out. He said, okay. I'm going to send you to the pit of hell. He said, well, don't do they Please don't send us to hell yet. So, all right, I'll send you to those pigs. And so the pigs, 
uh, they, you know, a pig is an unclean animal. They shouldn't have been growing pigs anyhow. So there was a double whammy on that. The other guy said, uh, you know, I, I want to go with you. And he said, no, you go home and do your thing. So there was a purpose in all of it. But you say, why did he do that? How, how can I answer? Why did Jesus, why did he do anything? I mean, he did it because he's listened perfectly to God the Father. That's why. And he knew exactly. He never made a mistake. All the rest of us apologize. I mean, I apologize. Terry apologized. We all apologize. We all made mistakes. Jesus never once had to apologize because he listened to the voice of God. And he was God in the flesh. He didn't make mistakes. Well, that's all the time we have thank for today, but thank you okay. and thank you. It's great to hear from you always. Well, still ahead, meet one of the youngest managers of a major drugstore chain. To me was a real eye opener. You know, I'm like, wow, this is possible. It is real. It was proof in my eyes that it does work. This millennial shares the secret of his success with you. That's coming up. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort is looking at seven and a half years behind bars. Wednesday, a federal judge in Washington sentenced Manafort to 43 months on conspiracy charges, adding to another sentence handed down last week in Virginia. The federal charges sprang from Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. Immediately after the sentencing, New York state prosecutors issued new indictments against Manafort. Well, Britain's parliament says it won't leave the European Union without a deal, voting Wednesday not to leave the EU unless an agreement is reached. The surprise move comes after parliament rejected Prime Minister Theresa May's second Brexit agreement with the EU, plunging the situation into chaos and confusion before the official separation date on March 29th. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. But the company where he works, James Lewis, is the boss. And he's only 23 years old. James credits all his success to something he learned while watching The 700 Club. James Lewis is one of the youngest managers of a major drugstore chain. When he got his first job there in high school, he immediately knew what he wanted to do with his money, thanks to what he'd learned growing up watching The 700 Club. When I was a young teenager, I, I watched it even more. And I started to really become curious about the Bible, and I just started reading it. And I heard about tithing, so I decided to put it to the test. I expected um, just for God to work His miracles, just to open up doors for me, and to really uh, almost prove to me that it is real. As James began to give, he saw more doors open. He received extra hours and decided to increase his giving to CBN. I, uh, whenever I got a, a, big, a bigger paycheck to work more hours, I would always give more um, to help out other people, of course. And just knowing that my money is going to help whatever the 700 Club may need it really makes me feel well. As James continued to give, he continued to receive promotions. Within three years of starting his job, he earned a promotion to store manager. That, to me, was a real eye-opener, you know, I'm like, wow, this is possible, it is real. And because of all the opportunities he's given me in the past um, to get to that position, it was proof in my eyes that it does work and that you do reap what you sow. Now James is putting himself through college as he continues to climb the company ladder. And when asked about the secret to his success, he says the key is found in giving faithfully to the Lord. I would encourage others to give to CBN because it's such a great organization. They're global. They help people around the world every day. Operation Blessing, the testimonies. It gives people hope and strength and comfort. I think if people start giving and just give God a chance, uh, give something, anything, whatever you can do, and discover the law of reciprocity, you'll start seeing doors being opened for you. God bless him. Isn't that true? The Bible says, given, it'll be given unto you. Pressed down, good measure, running over, will men heap into your bosom. 
That's the law of reciprocity. You give and it will be given unto you. So James has got it. And uh, the Lord, man, is the youngest store manager in that whole chain. Yes, that's awesome. 23 years old. Good. Isn't that great? And the listen, for those of you, the, what's the 700 Club? Well, it's $10 a month. Excuse me, $20 a month. And uh, it's 63 cents a day. And I want to send you something called the I Wills of God. I think it'll be a blessing to you. You have a well. This is Julie. She lives in Camden, Ohio, and she's had occasion to watch this DVD. And this is what Julie has to say: The I Wills of God DVD was a blessing. I lived in constant fear that I may get cancer and not live to be around to see my eight children and my one grandbaby grow up, and I feared losing a child. After watching this DVD, I declared in Jesus' name for healing on my children. And and me, and she's no longer fearful of all of well, those things. You want to get this. This will bless you. It's from the 91st Psalm, and it's really something tremendous. Hey, so. I have an answer to prayer here for you. Yeah, Would you like to hear it? Quick. This is Diana. She lives in Athens, Tennessee, suffered from asthma, dependent on using oxygen daily. She was watching this program. She heard you pray. Someone with asthma is being healed. You can hardly breathe, but God right now is opening up your airways, and that condition is leaving you in the name of Jesus. She said she took a deep breath, immediately noticed an improvement, has not used extra oxygen since the day she prayed with you. Thank God. On air. So okay. thank you, well, Lord. God answers prayer. Well, uh, today's Power Minute is from uh, the Psalm 37. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.